in fact, what I want to present is a little bit the landscape in the last 20 years in Venice, but particularly the case study of the contemporary art scene. Well, just last year in Venice, as you may know, we had the Venice Biennale in 2019. And indeed, every two years, Venice becomes, for the visual arts, uh, kind of one of the main world hubs of uh, the uh, contemporary art world. Uh, just take a look at the city map uh, of the Venice Biennale last year. So what you can see here, is this a pointer? Oh, it is, wonderful, how digital we are. So this is the main exhibition venue of the Arsenale. This is the historic exhibition venue of the Giardini di Castello. But everything you see over here, the little, the little letters, uh, one's in orange, the other one's a little in, in a, a lighter pink, I think. Well, these are other participating countries or collateral events. The total of them is over 100 little exhibitions spread in Venice. So uh, it's definitely, and for a city which now only retains uh, a little more than 50,000 citizens, it is a huge offer in contemporary art, which definitely is not designed for the citizens, for the Venetians, but for an international audience. So let's see a little bit of the figures, because this is why I wanted to uh, focus on the case of Venice. These are actually the uh, visitor figures just of the last 10 years uh, for the Venice Biennale, starting in 2009, because this is the year in 2008 when the, um, when the actually standing president of the Biennale, Paolo Baratta, uh, retook office again. So um, there is one management line in these last 10 years. So he started in 2009 with almost 400,000 visitors for the Venice Biennale. If we would go farther back to 2001, 2003, that's when, when I worked for the Biennale, we were actually having only 200,000 visitors per, per Biennale, which, which wasn't, which isn't, which isn't much, of course. If you, if you would compare these figures to the Documenta in Castle, they do, they do many more visitors, but still, it's quite a lot. And the numbers have gone up, up, and up. So um, there's a lot of people coming to Venice to see contemporary art. And this is the participation in the last 10 years. You see how many, how many foreign countries participate in the Biennale the Orange here. Uh, the last year, almost 90 participating countries. And this is the number of collateral events. You would see that collateral events are going down. And here the reason is very easy. Collateral events have to pay to enter the Biennale. Participating countries, of course, pay, but they don't have to pay a fee to the Biennale. So there has been a halt in the, in the last few years. But still, a lot of lot is going on. But Venice is not just the Biennale in the contemporary artscape. Um, it, is, it is much more. At least in the last 20 years, these are a few of the major um, competitors or other organizations, institutions involved in contemporary art that deliver important exhibitions every year, not just every two years like the Biennale. Capesaro, who is originally uh, the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, which started collecting uh, pieces from the Biennale back starting in 1895. Then, of course, the Peggy Guggenheim collection. And then very new ones that just, that just came, came about in the last 15, 20 years. The Fondazione Prada, Punta della Dogana, and Palazzo Grassi, which is the Pinot Foundation. Or, uh, for instance, the Fondazione Emilio Anna Bianca Vedova, uh, one the, the most important Venetian painter. These are just a few. If we make a total count, there are at least roughly 200 important contemporary art events every two years in Venice, which is, again, a huge number. And so it really sets a good landscape to see what happened in the last 20 years, also as regards to participatory practices and digital development. Probably many of you would say, well, of course, there is the Biennale in Venice. How couldn't it be that there is so much fuss about contemporary art? Well, it's, it's funny to, to think about it, but in 1995, when the Biennale became, became 100 years old, there were Italian politicians discussing, seriously discussing, to close the Biennale for good because it costed too much. And 
It didn't happen, luckily. On the contrary, in 1998, the three study cases I'm now um, briefly presenting are the ones that I, um, that I named the three Venetian majors, because these are the museums that make uh, for budget, reputation, and audience the big, the big numbers. Well, in 1998, the Venice Piano was reformed, and again in 2004, it still is mainly uh, funded by, by the government, but it is now a private, almost private foundation. And with this reformation, they also started to enter new participatory practices and a digital development. The same can be said with the Peggy Guggenheim collection, which was founded more recently in 1980 after the death of, of Peggy in 1979. And throughout the, the forthcoming decades, the museum has been enlarged and enlarged. It isn't a very big museum today, but still it is in Italy the most visited contemporary art museum with almost 500, half a million visitors per year. You add them to the almost 800,000 of the Biennale. And the Francois Finot, uh, um, Fondation François Pinot, which just opened in 2006, taking over Palazzo Grassi, and then later in 2009, the Punta della Dogana, which was restored by the architect Tadao Ando. Well, together they make one and a half million visitors for contemporary art. It is quite a lot. It is maybe just a cultural niche for Venice, which counts almost 25,000 million tourists per year which have an enormous impact on the city, of course, as I was saying, 50,000 citizens, 25 million visitors. It's quite a challenge. But still, these are three major institutions, not just for Venice, not just for Italy, but definitely worldwide. And there are all three in Venice, not by any chance. So let's see what coordinates we can use to analyze what uh, these three uh, institutions tried to do with regard to participatory practices and digital development. So I tried to put on such a sort of um, double binary scheme with trade-offs. On the one we see we have where the, the use participatory practices or where they are authoritative. On the other side, on the other part, there is the things they do on site or the things they do online. Why these coordinates? Well, here there are maybe a use, some useful quotes by, by um, scholars that have analyzed the impact of digital development and participatory practices in the last 10, 15 years. Well, as for instance, uh, Paul Marty says, the importance of taking a visitor-centered approach when developing digital museum resources makes it understand that it is important to develop online tools for visitors and not just to represent the institution. And then Katie Karp says there have been two stages in the last two decades, because roughly the digital development, at least for these three Venetian institutions, started in 2006, 2007, not, not much earlier. So in these 15, 20 years, we had a first stage a comfortable evolutionary extension of museum activity into the digital realm, so just an extension of what they were already doing. And then a second stage, roughly in the last five to six years, at least for the case of these Venetian institutions, where the appearance of virtual museums, or at least I would say of, of digital tools produced by people that were not familiar with the visitor, with the museum profession. As regards the other coordinates, participatory versus authoritative um, approaches, well, here again two useful quotes. Contradictions must be resolved between museum practices which privilege the account of the expert and distribute it to social technology practices whose strengths lie in allowing for many, sometimes contradictory perspectives. So this is what should be per participatory for, for scholars. Or again, whether heritage institutions can move from their position as authoritative experts towards empowering public values at this subtle level. Okay, so these are the hypothetic goals where the institutions, at least for the scholars, should have arrived. So let's see, what did the Biennale do over the last few years? 
Well, first of all, and this is, this is true for uh, all three uh, Venetian majors, the first decade of, of the 21st century, um, the digital development, of course, they had websites, uh, and, and we were trying also to do something meaningful, uh, at least to have a, a, a useful vitrine on the internet. But the focus of the, three, of the three majors was, in the first decade of the 21st century, the educational programs, building the educational programs. Of course, maybe the Venetian institutions got there quite late as compared to UK institutions or, or North American institutions, which already had consistent and big educational programs back in the 1980s and especially in the 1990s. So the first big effort for these three institutions was getting into participatory practices by founding educational programs, but not always educational uh, departments, which, which at least for the Binale is, is quite a flaw because if you don't have uh, internal staff working continuously on an educational program, this, this can be, of course, sometimes uh, quite difficult. Well, meanwhile, in, we started the educational programs in 2013 for the 50th um, Venice Biennale. And, and since then, so it's now 17, yes, 16, 17 years, there are programs for almost everything. On the link, you can see what they did for 2019. The challenge for the Binale is always that every two years, there is a different curator. There are totally different artists. So every, every two years, everything has to be completely, completely new. The Biennale Azak, instead is another project which, which actually uh, as a, is an acronym that stands for Archivio Storico delle Arti Contemporane, which means so much as um, archive, historical archive of the contemporary arts, which uh, funnily, uh, it's not just me that believes that, but probably every, every art historian that knows the Biennale is, 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 the, is the real treasure of the Biennale. So this is probably the richest archive of contemporary arts, not just visual arts, but also theater, music, dance, cinema, and architecture, that holds artworks, documents, photographies, videos of what happened at the Biennale from 1895 to today. In 1973, this department, the archive, was founded, and it, it, they already started to, um, to have at least the metadata of what they have on, on, digital, on digital devices. And in the 1980s, the then director, Vladimiro Dorigo, was really trying to have, to have everything transferred to the first digital uh, internal network. Well, the problem with the archive is that uh, having so many events at the Biennale, the archive is the least financed and in the 1990s, they lost a lot of, of the treasures they, they should have preserved. The archive was reformed in 2001, but since then, well, actually, I don't know, shall I be brave enough to go onto this link? Let's try. Yeah. Is it working, is it working? Yes, it's working. Well, what they came up with, of course, as you can see, Oh, goodness. Okay, so it's not working. Okay, <laughs> thank you. How disappointing. Well, anyway, if you, if you would follow that link, what you would came, come to is just a few nice pictures of what uh, the new library opened in 2009 at the Giardini del Biennale looks like, a beautiful venue. But online, they just have roughly a library catalog. So even for, for um, pictures of the artworks displayed, Oh, you cannot see anything even here. Ah, oh, wonderful. Is it working now? It's not working. It's working. Thank you. So uh, it's, 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 basically, it's basically useless. And unfortunately, in the last 10 years, the archive uh, hasn't been a priority for the Biennale. In the last 10 years, there isn't even a scientific director of the archive. And that's quite a pity, but uh, the archive has been left behind, probably because the, the uh, actual president, Paolo Baratta, 
has other priorities like this one, which is the Biennale channel, which has started quite some years ago. Uh, not just a YouTube channel, but it also worked on uh, together with Sky TV. Uh, where the Biennale is basically live streaming and, and then keeping records of almost every conference, presentation, opening that is being done at the Venice Biennale. Not just for the visual arts, but of course, as you can imagine, for the, for the film festival, because the film festival is organized by, by the Venice Biennale. So there is, there is a, huge, a huge amount of materials, interviews, conferences, uh, quite interesting ones sometimes, but basically, it, it, the Biennale channel tries to be uh, yeah, like, a, like, a, like a TV channel or a, or a broadcast. It's, not, it's, not really, it's neither an archive nor a museum, a digital museum. So this is what they came up with. So let's see what the Peggy Guggenheim collection did in the last, in the last 20 years. Well, they had a, a, a relevant advantage. The big advantage of the Guggenheim, of the Peggy Guggenheim collection, is that it relies on on the collection of Peggy Guggenheim, who was an uh, incredible lady, and uh, <clears throat> who had an incredible collection. Because if you go, if you have ever been to the Venice uh, Guggenheim Museum, if you haven't, please go there. I mean, there are just so many masterpieces that she she managed to collect over the years, particularly in 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 the nineteen in the nineteen forties. So that the the museum, which is a local branch now of the of the bigger Solomon Guggenheim uh, Foundation, has immediately started to work around the catalog of the collection, which uh, is historically and philologically also quite correct because because Peggy Guggenheim, when she when she started collecting uh, her works before having a museum, she started drafting a catalog. So she really she really thought that cataloging. Uh, artworks, having, having texts by, by art historians, they didn't call them curator at the time, but Marcel Duchamp, for instance, was basically her, her in-house curator. Well, having all this work, um, communication work and scholarly work around her collection, she thought was even more important than having it displayed. So uh, the, today's website is very easy searchable. Uh, you can you can you can you can see all all the um, all the artworks that are on display and also the ones that are not on display with of course further information. The quality of the images is not always the best, but this year uh, they are having a new a new website with some some interesting features. And starting all around the the uh, the catalog, the Guggenheim collection, because of their link to the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation, started very early already in the 1980s and 1990s to have educational programs. They were lead, really leading uh, leading institution in, in Italy, or at least for Southern Europe, especially in the contemporary arts, uh, in, in having educational programs. Um, and they rely very much on internship programs. So, um, and this helps particularly the involvement of younger audiences. For instance, they have uh, a very easy progress. I mean, they have interns both from the North America and from Italy, uh, all in their 20s, mainly, or, or late teenagers. They were very well trained at the museum, and they, um, the program is called, um, if I remember correctly, Ask me about the artwork. The, these young people just just stand around in the rooms, and you can you can they are like like mediators. You can you can ask them, and have have a nice conversation about the artworks on display, uh, without uh, without the distance that very often museum uh, creates. But then there have been two quite uh, recent developments that are both important for participatory practices and uh, for uh, digital tools. The first here, you can, you can see it on the link, is a Guggenheim virtual tour, which basically functions like, like Google Earth, so, so uh, it, 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 has been, uh, it has been created in-house. It works quite well, the definition is also quite good, the only problem is that you, can, you cannot travel, go through the rooms, but you see just one room at a time. 
And basically you have, you have the floor map and you decide in which room to enter. You see here, you saw it first, we had Picasso and here again, Le Bagnat, the Picasso. So, um, of course, the definition is quite good. Of course, the view of the artwork is not always the best because of the, of the lights, how they, how they get into the room at the time the, the uh, videos were made. But anyway, it is quite a good substitution for, for someone who cannot be physically there. Another interesting project, which isn't digital, but tactile and uh, just performed on site, is the, in Italian it's called doppio senso, double sense. In the last 10 years, the Guggenheim has started, this is again Le Bagnat by Pablo Picasso, for, uh, for uh, people that are visually impaired. So every, every, every few months, the, Biena, uh, the, Biena, sorry, the Guggenheim collection is producing together with a blind artist. He is producing these pieces that try to translate the atmosphere, the colors, uh, the, the texture of some of the masterpieces of the Peggy Guggenheim collection. The last, uh, as, yeah, as you can see, this is, this is Le Bagnat of Pablo Picasso. So the last study case, just to see what they did, Punta de la Dogana and Palazzo Grassi speak the uh, Fondation François Pinot. Well, as you can see here, this is the Colossus by Damon Hirst in his solo, big solo exhibition in, back in 2017. When the Fondation François Pinot came to Venice, they didn't want to have just a, a very small, a small museum, but they really wanted to become a major, a major player, not just in Venice, but, but worldwide. Uh, as regards audience attendance, they haven't been as lucky as the Guggenheim collection, even though the Peggy Guggenheim collection as a venue is 10 times smaller than the, than the François Pinot uh, Fondation. Uh, they have more visitors than, than François Pinot. And so what uh, Palazzo Grassi has, try, has been trying to do was building a new audience, especially on educational programs. As you can see here, they're using also a lot of, of technological devices just to, to give augmented reality or deeper information on the exhibitions they're having. Again, they have um, a, bit, a bit of the problems, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the other two institutions. The first, the first weakness is like the Biennale. Every year, the, the, the Fondation has new exhibitions with new artists. So every time you have to rebuild all the contents for the educational programs and the digital programs. But on the other side, it is working uh, uh, almost around the year. So the staff, also the educational staff, is in an internal staff, so with, with much more solidity. The most interesting um, project they did is actually this, this sort, as has been said before, um, a crowdsourcing project, really. It's teens.palazzograssi.it, a website that you can navigate, where together with teenagers, teenagers have built oh, these, uh, this website, the content of this website, which is reflecting, like a small Wikipedia, the histories, the images of artworks and artists that have been displayed at Palazzo Grassi and Punta della Dogana. So, to come to conclusions, where do uh, these three majors stand? or at least where I would put them as regard to the coordinates I put before. Well, I'm sorry for the Biennale, but they are still quite authoritative. Even the, the Biennale channel and, and everything they are doing, they're on balance between on-site and online practices, but they're still quite authoritative as, as they, with everything they do, are rather trying to reinstate their leading reputation in the contemporary art scene. So this is definitely their aim. With regard to the Peggy Guggenheim collection, um, they have worked well on their strength, having a wonderful permanent collection of, of uh, modern and contemporary art. And they have gone much more into participatory practice, as you could see with uh, the, the virtual reality tour and the tactile tours. On the other side, the Fondation François Pinot, I would rather place it more on some kind of online services like this uh, participatory website because they're still trying to involve more audience. 
So are these truly new approaches? I'm not really sure. Uh, what these three institutions have done is trying to switch their aims with digital tools and participatory practices. Probably we need to move away from a binary opposition between real objects and their digital representations, and instead explore the possibilities offered for an alternative reciprocal model of engaging with things. And furthermore, again in this quote, understand whether users are becoming more engaged by digital tools, and if so, what the value of this engagement is for their experience of heritage. The conclusion from the three Venetian majors is that, at least for Italy and for the Italian audience, contemporary art is itself a constantly contested territory, which is floating between, on one side, an ever wider as well as inclusive definition of art, anything can be art, and on the other side, the seemingly arcane as well as exclusive ways for its legitimacy or validation. Anybody can be an artist. The three Venetian majors show that the solutions they have worked out with regard to digital development and participatory challenges spark rather from local solutions rather than from international benchmarks or scholarly knowledge, which is a fault maybe for us in the academia. What makes the difference here is rather the institutional framework of the single three institutions and the organizational approach they decide to have on these tasks, the educational programs and the digital development. Uh, and this is drawn from uh, one of the major business uh, administration professors, Alfred Chandler, uh, since the SWOT analysis has been, has been spoken of, I can also speak of Alfred Chandler. So, the contemporary art scene in Venice, I believe we're not quite at what Jacques Rancière said about the emancipated spectator, but still, these three Venetian majors are trying hard. Thank you very much.